Lord, we thank you for this chapter in the book of Genesis, and we just ask that you would help us understand it. Please illumine our heart and mind. We ask you to fill Pastor with your spirit. Just give him uh, the mind and the clarity to deliver exactly what you've given him as a message. And pray that you would help us go out and live it out, Lord, in Christ's name. All right. Genesis 28, as we continue our series through the book of Genesis, there's some really neat things in this chapter. There's probably more than I can really dig into completely tonight. Uh, for the sake of time, we're going to look at a couple things. There are seven specific blessings that are listed here and some curses. Now, if you remember in the previous chapter, in chapter 27, he received the birthright blessing, right? That firstborn blessing, he received that privately now we're going to see these public blessings that are given to him and we'll see some curses and the curses are really on Esau from where he went and took a wife of Ishmael to add to the Canaanite wives that he already had he went and married uh, more wicked women he was in, in this he had a, a disobedience it really shows he didn't want the the birthright he didn't want the blessing he didn't want to be obedient he didn't want to please his parents there was a curse on him for that for the first half of the sermon though I really want to focus in on this thought of this Jacob's Ladder that we see here. Uh, we've probably all heard of Jacob's Ladder before. Um, I mean, there's children's stories about it. A lot of interesting parallels that are happening here. Um, and I'll tell you just straight up, Jacob's Ladder is representing how Jesus provides a way from the earth to heaven. It is symbolic, like Jesus is the ladder in a sense. And I want to prove that from the scriptures, old and new. I want to show you some really neat things that it was a picture of Christ to come. It was a picture of the promises and the covenants. It had all of that in that story. And imagine laying down, taking a nap, and God revealing to you, seeing the Lord, seeing access to heaven, and God promising a blessing to you. You'd probably come out of that. He was afraid, but also encouraged and willing to make some promises to God and live for God. So neat stuff happening here in this chapter. Let's start in verse number 10. Chapter 28, verse number 10. And Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place. He's going to lay down on the stones. And it's interesting, our, our Bible uh, memorization verse for this week, 1 Corinthians 3.11, and uh, that foundation is laid, uh, which is Christ, right? And I, can't, I can't even quote it. I don't have it memorized yet. Um, right? No other foundation can man, any man lay. That is Christ. Christ is the rock. He is the rock of offense to some. He's the rock of our salvation. Uh, we are built upon Him as our foundation, as lively stones. He's building up His spiritual house, New Jerusalem, and we're built up you know, stone by stone, if you will. Uh, so it's interesting. He takes of these stones, he begins to do some work, but he's taking this stone, it's going to be his foundation, of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. Now, i got to tell you, a, a rock for a pillow? I don't know, my wife switched pillows, so I, I, she has a really nice one, so I borrowed it, and I'm, I am not having it. That is, it's too springy for me. That feels like a rock. I, you know, I, I don't know about you guys. I like a little bit softer than a rock. Can you imagine going into the mattress, mattress factory outlet or whatever, and be like, do you have anything rock hard, you know? I don't know about that, but of course, their body was different. They weren't used to this soft lifestyle that we live in the big foam beds. They slept on the ground and on sheep skins and on rocks and they wanted a firm foundation, a flat foundation. And I imagine their bodies were a little bit stronger than ours for that reason, if nothing else. And they're probably grounding out. They're getting all the negative energy out. There's a lot there, but I do find it interesting. Sorry, we'll just leave all that. Let's get to this story. There's some, there's some really cool stuff. It says at the end of verse 11, and lay down in that place to sleep. You know what's happening here? He's ceased from his works and he's entered into the rest. Now Hebrews 4 tells us that's a picture of salvation. You have to cease from your own works. Uh, no repentance. You got to repent of your dead works and have faith toward God. Hebrews 6 would tell us. He's entered into the rest. He's laying down. He's going to sleep. And now look at verse 12. It says, And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set upon the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. This ladder to heaven, there are many, uh, many references to this even in 
common culture, they'll call it a stairway to heaven. I'm here to tell you, the Lord Jesus Christ is your only stairway to heaven. The ladder to heaven is God Almighty. It's through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have access to heaven without Him. He is our only hope. Jesus is your stairway. How do we get to heaven? Well, uh, through to the Father, through the Son is how we pray, and that's how we get saved also. Okay, So we get to heaven through Jesus. I want to share some neat stuff. Go to John chapter 1. Go to John chapter 1 with me. And again, I, I'm just being up front and forward about it. I believe it's just a picture of Christ to come. Christ has fulfilled so many Old Testament prophecies. He's on every page just about. Uh, but we don't usually see it because we're caught up in looking at the nation and the wars and the kings and all of those things. But everything in here is for our example. It's for our example so that we would understand God's love toward us, His salvation, His loving kindness, His mercy, His forgiveness. And a lot of these are prophecies and illustrations that were lived out by real people. And it would be a prophecy that the Lord Jesus Christ would fulfill. Just as He's fulfilled many prophecies and the feasts and things like that. Now John, at the end of John chapter 1, I love this passage, this little, uh, these last few pieces. Uh, in verse 40 he says, And one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother. So right away he goes to get his family saved, right? Or they're probably already saved. They're looking for the Christ. Simon, and saith unto him, look at this statement, We have found the Messiah, which being interpreted is the Christ. John 1 does a lot of interpretation for us. What is the Messiah? Well, it's the Christ. Jesus Christ, He is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. He came to die for all of our sins. So it gives us the interpretation. And notice He said, we found the one that we're looking for, is what He's saying. We were looking for Him. We're trusting in Him. He's here. He's alive. He's on the earth. Come and meet Him. Verse 42, And He brought Him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld Him, He said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas, which by interpretation is a stone. Now, that's just the, kind of one introduction. Jump ahead again to verse 48. Verse, actually, look at verse 47. 46, that's fine, 46. I should have just read it all. Uh, yeah, let's just keep reading. 43, I'm sorry, guys. I was, for the sake of time, I'm trying to trim it, but there's so much good stuff here. Let's eat all the meat. 43, the day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was, was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip findeth Nathanael. Here's another, right? And saith unto him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and in the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Interesting. He's called the son of Joseph. Uh, son of Abraham. He's called the son of David. All of these things are pictures of Christ to come. He's telling us he's in the Old Testament all throughout. Verse 46, And Nathanael said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said unto him, Come and see. Now he's probably being a skeptic. He probably knew the prophecies about Christ coming out of Egypt and coming out of Bethlehem. Maybe he missed the one about Nazareth and he's trying to be a skeptic. Wait a minute. Nazareth? I know my Bible, and where's Jesus coming from Nazareth? Maybe, you know, he obviously missed something there. Uh, but I, a, a healthy skeptic, I believe, based on the Scriptures, verse 47, Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith of him. Now, this is Jesus' statement about this man. Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. He says this man really is of the children of God, and there is no guile in him. This statement is saying this man is saved. Jesus is telling us this man is saved. There, when there's no guile, that means your sins have been paid for. He says when you're an Israelite indeed, right? We're of the Israel of God, right? He, he's trying to say, this is one of my children. That was his initial statement to Nathaniel, the skeptic. Verse 48, Nathanael said unto him, Whence knowest thou me? He says, What do you know about me? Right? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Now, I believe he was having a moment with the Lord, praying unto the Lord out of a pure heart and the Holy Spirit. He was talking to God. And Jesus says, I was there when you were praying to me. And I believe he revealed himself through the Holy Spirit, not just his words. He's confirming uh, that. He's confirming the Spirit there. Verse 49, 
Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God. Thou art the King of Israel. What is he's like, you're the one we're looking for. You are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. We've been waiting for you to come. Verse 50, Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than thee. Now look at verse 51. This is the key to the whole thing. And he saith unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven opened, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. He says, you're the Son of God. You're the King of Israel. He says, you want to see something? I'm going to open heaven, and you're going to see angels coming up and down me. What an interesting thing. This is exactly what we see with Jacob's ladder. Angels ascending and descending. The Lord at the top. How do we get to heaven? Well, it's all through Jesus. What is the symbolism of Jacob's ladder? It's not by works of righteousness which we have done. It's not like the Tower of Babel that we saw in Genesis chapter 11 where men were building a tower to reach unto heaven. No, no, no. This is of the Lord. He opens it up. Heaven's open. Jesus comes. He's the Son of God. He's the Son of Man. He says, now watch this. I'm going to show you angels ascending and descending on Him. Talk about confirming more Scripture. Nathaniel's mind was probably just blown. He's like, whoa, this guy, this is it. This is what we waited for. I imagine he was really really excited. This is kind of neat. Go to John 3. Go to John chapter 3. Now John 3 of course is uh, famous. What must He says you, you must be born again. You have to be born spiritually. You were born of the water when you came out of your mom's womb. But now you have to be born spiritually. How do I do that? Whosoever believeth, right? Who on the, on, the, on the only begotten Son will have everlasting life. These promises are here. But in between that in verse 13, go to John 3 verse 13. Jesus speaking. Notice it's red letter. And for good reason, and no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. This is so important. Jesus Christ on the earth is telling you, I came from heaven, I'm on earth, and I'm in heaven. There's only one that has the power to be everywhere. Even the devil... You guys, understand this. We're going to talk about the devil on Sunday. The devil is not everywhere. He is not all-powerful. He may have devils. He may have minions. Only God is everywhere. Amen. Jesus Christ, standing on the earth, said, Hey, I'm the Son of Man. You want to, Ascending, descending, and I'm up there as well. This is a proclamation of His Godhood. If you would, go to Proverbs chapter 30. Go to Proverbs chapter 30. In John 6, he says, what? And if you see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before, Jesus Christ is Jacob's ladder. And Jacob's ladder is a picture, an illustration, a spiritual lesson that's given to him so that he would understand salvation. The gospel was preached to his father and his grandfather, and it was preached to him. And he, as a believer, I'm not so sure about his brother, but Jacob had faith. And we're going to see that strengthened throughout this as God continues to give him more information about himself and reveals himself in new and unique ways, just as God will with every one of you throughout your life. I promise. Uh, it, without faith, it's impossible to please him. Uh, for he that cometh to him must believe that he is, you believe that God exists, and that he is a diligent rewarder of them that seek him. You come to God believing, I know you exist, and I know you'll reward me for seeking after you. Please reward me with more knowledge of you. Help me to understand you more. I want to get closer to you. You made me. You know me better than anybody else, and I want to know you. And Help me see your will for me, and give me the power to overcome the problems in the flesh, and help me to be a more spiritual person. When you come to God with that kind of faith, He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. You're in Proverbs chapter 30. Look at verse number 4. Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fist? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name? If thou canst tell. Ooh, what is his son's name? Now in Proverbs 30, they didn't know his son's name, did they? Right? Uh, go to Genesis 32. Go back to Genesis. Go to Genesis chapter number 32. Uh, as we're seeing Jacob, as we go through, Gen uh, through Genesis now, 
We see the blessing that was given to him in private. Genesis 28, tonight we're going to see the blessings that were given to him publicly, publicly proclaimed by his father. And uh, later in chapter 32, when we get there, I'm excited for it, it's where he wrestles a man all night. It turns out to be the Lord himself. He touches the hollow of his thigh, makes him uh, hobble for the rest of his life. Here in Genesis 32, let me get there with you, find verse 27. Genesis 32, near the end, verse now, well, look, look at verse 26, it's pretty good. He says, and he said, let me go, for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go, except thou bless me. There's Jacob wrestling for his blessing, fighting for it. Verse 27, and he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with man, and has prevailed. This is really interesting because Israel is a very unique name. And he's, it means what it says here in the context, that, uh, that he's a prince that has power with God and has prevailed. I often wonder if the name Israel isn't just another name for Jesus. Much like Emmanuel was revealed to be God with us when Christ would come, if Israel is another way of saying the prince that has power with God. I often wonder, and, uh, and I, I believe there's a, a good parallel here, you know, you know, that Jesus, in a sense, is Israel. Israel, in a sense, is Jesus. Uh, this isn't replacement theology. This is saying that Jesus fulfilled everything that was promised to Israel. Jacob becoming the new man. Here's the picture of the new birth in the Old Testament. This is an illustration. He gives him a new name. He's going to give him a new birth. He's going to have a new life moving forward from here. All these things are happening, and he's called a prince. Well, Jesus is uh, the, the prince of peace in Isaiah 9, 6, he's called. Now, Jesus is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He's called the king of Israel. He's called the king of the Jews. He is both the prince and a king. He has different authorities of different things. But here, as this angel says, I'm going to call you something, Jacob. I'm going to call you Israel. And Jacob, in verse 29, look at the next verse. He says, and Jacob asked him and said, tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he said, Wherefore is it that thou dost ask my name? And he blessed him there. Now, wait a minute. He blessed him there. This is interesting. He's saying, Tell me your name. Who is he wrestling here? Well, earlier it tells us it's a man. Read the next verse. It tells us it's God. He says, And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. God wrestled a man in the form of a man, and he gave him a brand new name, Israel, and he said, what's your name? When he asked God's name or the angel's name or the man's name, when Jacob asked that, he says, look at verse 29. Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name? And he blessed him there. I think God kind of gave him one of his names. Like we're called Christians. We take on part of Christ's name in a sense. I think Israel's part of that, that he would be God's people, that he would be one of God's servants. This reminds me, in Judges 13, when the prophecy that Samson would be born, if you guys remember, Manoah was the father, and, and first the wife sees, then this angel shows up. So there's a series of things that happen there. They're speaking, and they actually ask the angel his name. Let me read what he says. In Judges 13, 18, it says, And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret? Now, God reveals himself with different names at different times to show you more of his characteristics. After he said that, the angel did wondrously, and he ascended in the flame, it says. In Judges 13, 22, it says, And Manoah said unto his wife, We shall surely die, because we have seen God. Just as, as Jacob's wrestling God, Manoah saw God in the form of an angel, in the form of a man. What an interesting thing. But both of them, why are you asking my name? It's a secret. So I think Israel may be one of those things. Now go back to Genesis 28, uh, where he's, Israel, in a sense, is a name of God. It's a name of Jesus. It's a name of the Son of God. It's a prophecy of the Christ to come. In 2 Chronicles 7.14, famous passage, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. There are Christians today that proclaim this, and I say amen. 
Notice it starts, this is the recipe for revival. It starts with repentance and praying and seeking God's face. Lord, our land is ruined. What do we do? Well, what are you doing? How's your personal walk? But he says in this, in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people, which are called by my name, that's verse 14. In that same chapter, you go to verse 3, and it says, uh, all the children of Israel. What name of God were they called by in the Old Testament? Israel. What name of God are we called by in the New Testament? Well, we're called Christians. Does it not make sense? We are that spiritual nation that's always existed. It existed as a physical nation, as a picture of Christ, and many of the things that they did were fulfilled with the coming of Christ. Just as in Isaiah 7 it talks about, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. It's Matthew 1.23 that tells us, being interpreted, which is God with us, that God would come down and be with us. What a blessing. And so I, I, I show you all that to show you that I believe in a sense. Jacob's ladder, this may be a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jacob has this amazing dream. He calls it the gate of heaven. There are gates of hell and there are gates of heaven. And, and listen, we have power over the gates of hell. They can't prevail over us because the Lord Jesus Christ is actively building His church through believers. And it's our job to go out and, and defend the gospel and preach the gospel and uh, take it to the gates of hell, if you will, in a sense. But um, uh, I, I see this Jacob's Ladder, this gate of heaven, as the bridge between God and man. And that is Christ Jesus. It's the only way for man to be reconciled to God. It's symbolic of Jesus to come and also the covenants of promise that we have through faith. Now, uh, while there's time left, uh, and I'll be short on this, but um, in Genesis 28, I want to show you the seven blessings that are in this chapter. In the previous chapter, chapter 27, all of those blessings we talked about last week were very private. He did it in a tent, just two men talking. He leaves. The brother comes in and finds out. No, no! Isn't there not a blessing for me? And He got one, but did he really? You're going to live by the sword? What kind of blessing is that? So these blessings are separate, different, unique, and yet similar. There's seven of them total in this chapter. Uh, look at verse number one for the first. It is the marriage blessing. And Isaac called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said unto him, Thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. Arise, go to Padanaram to the house of Bethuel, thy mother's father, and take thee a wife from thence of the daughters of Laban, thy mother's brother. So here's the blessing. He says, go and take a wife. You say, what's my purpose in life? It's to take a wife if you're a man. It's to have a husband if you're a woman. This is the marriage blessing. This is the first law that God gave to men. Now on Sunday I said, what is the first commandment? And brother Chad said, to love God and love your brother. And I said he was wrong. And I publicly corrected him, but he was right in a sense, because twice in the New Testament he says, what is the first commandment? Meaning, in reference to the first of the ten, but it's called the first and the greatest. That's to love the Lord your God. So you were right even when I corrected you wrong. And what I was really asking for is, what's the first law that God gives us in the Bible? And that is to have a family. And so here's the first blessing. The Father is publicly giving this marriage blessing to his son. Don't do this. You need to do this. It's a father's responsibility to direct his son in the type of wife that he should take. The purpose of life is to take a wife. Uh, so prepare yourself now. Prepare your children now. In Matthew 19 it says, Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Two become one flesh. Don't separate it for anything in this world. Hebrews 13, 4. Marriage is honorable in all, in the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Now there's God's judgment to come, but really, look, there is a judgment from God on this earth if you don't do the honorable thing and get married and stay married. You want to be a whoremonger or adulterer? <laughs> the way of transgressors is hard, and God will judge you on this earth for this, those sins, okay? That's the first blessing, is the marriage blessing. We'll look at verse number three for the second blessing. It's God's blessing on earth for protection and provision. Verse three, And God Almighty bless thee, and make thee fruitful, and multiply thee, that thou mayest be a multitude of people. God wants you to have everything you need, but especially to have children. 
That is God's will for your life. Once you get married, you would begin to populate the earth, to replenish the earth. Part of that first law, if you will, from Genesis. Uh, but this is God's earthly blessing. And this is important because notice, the Father is proclaiming the blessing of God on His Son. He's asking for a blessing from God. He's not just saying, I want you to do this, or I will give you my stuff. He's, he's proclaiming publicly the blessing of God on the future of His Son. That's God's blessing on earth called upon this man while he's alive, right? Uh, number three is in verse number four, if you will, and give thee the blessings of Abraham. Now, the blessings of Abraham is twofold. Most of you know in Genesis 12, 3, it says, I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Genesis had many, I believe it was, six or seven blessings given to Abraham in that chapter. We see just as many now here for Jacob, and it's kind of unique. There's two aspects to the Abrahamic blessing. One is the land, and one is the seed. One is the possession, and one is Christ. This is important. The land at the time was a picture, a physical picture, symbolism of receiving heaven and obviously eternal life. Um, the Abrahamic blessing. So let's read verses 3 and 4. It says, And God Almighty bless thee, and make thee fruitful. I'm sorry, verse 4. Uh, and, and give thee the blessing of Abraham to thee, and to thy seed with thee, that thou mayest inherit the land where there art a stranger, which God gave unto Abraham. All right, so there is that part, but Hebrews 11 tells us, For he looked for a city which hath foundations, which builder and maker is God. Abraham went into the land, left the land, came back to the land, and he looked for a city whose builder and maker is God. It's called New Jerusalem. It's called Heavenly Jerusalem. It's called the church of the firstborn that everybody that's ever been saved by faith will be part of one day. We'll all be gathered together one day. We're not there yet. That will be the church we look forward to in that city. So there was a physical land blessing that parallels the spiritual that goes along with it. Jump ahead to verse 14 because I want you to see this. This is the other side of the Abrahamic blessing. And that's the, that's the blessing of Christ. If you will, look at verse 14. It says, And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. This is word for word the promise that was given in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. It was given to Abraham. And it's interpreted in Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. Now Abraham and his seed, where the promise is made, he saith, not and two seeds as of many, but of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. The promise of salvation would come. We inherit that through Jesus Christ. He said to Abraham, the Christ will come through your seed. Now he's saying the same thing to Jacob. So the Abrahamic blessing is twofold. There was the promise of the land. And notice he's expelled and he comes back, kind of unique. But then there's also the promise of the blessing of Christ to come through his lineage. Now take a step back to chapter, verse number 5 and we'll look at number 5. And this is the Father's blessing. Verse 5, And Isaac sent away Jacob, and he went to Padanaram unto Laban, son of Bethuel the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob's and Esau's brother. When Esau saw that Isaac had blessed Jacob and had sent him away to pay Danaram to take him away from thence and that he is blessed and that as he blessed him, he gave him a charge saying, thou shalt not take a wife of the daughters of Canaan. So here his brother is envious at the father's blessing. And I think this is unique. And guys, I'm not dogmatic about any of these points. This is just some things I came up with in my notes of studying this. There may be more blessings, and I'm not looking for something that's not there. But this is important. Esau sees the father chose to give his brother a blessing. And this blessing that comes from a father is a choice that every parent has. Parents have the power to bless their children or to curse their children. Parents have the power to bless their children with their words or to curse their children 
with their words. This is a lesson that we need to remember. In Ephesians 4, 6 verse 4 it says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It's important for us not to drive them away from God because we're too rough and strict and no love. And, uh, and it's also important for us not to let them find their own way because a child left to themselves will bring the, the mother to shame, the father to shame, the parents to shame. Parents, don't drive them to wrath and don't let them figure it out on their own. You guide them and direct them. It says, bring them up in the nurture, that's love, and admonition of the Lord. Admonish them in the Lord. Point them to godly things. That's our job in our time. And parents, you have great power over your children and their future. And it all starts with your tongue. Your words. You choose whether you bless or curse your own children. The next one that I see here is in verse number 7. It is the sixth blessing. It says, And that Jacob obeyed his father and mother and was gone to pay Danaram. And then he goes into the sins of his brother. There is an obedience blessing. Now this one's your choice. The father did the best he could. The son received the instruction and obeyed and was a blessing to the father. Children, listen, you get to choose if God will bless you or not by whether or not you obey your parents. Children, if you choose to disobey your parents, if you choose to be hard-hearted or stiff-necked, if you choose to just give them eye service, but in your heart you're feeling something else, you want to do something else, I can't wait till I get out of here. If that's your attitude towards your parents and you harden your heart against their law, God's curse will be on your life. If you choose to receive the righteous instruction from your parents and obey it, there is a blessing for obedience. In Exodus chapter 20 where it gives the Ten Commandments, in verse 12 it says, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Now, who wants long life? I mean, this is a promise from God. Thank you, Christiana. She's the first one. She says, I want to live long. She's got a long way to go. She just turned five, right? Christiana, obey your parents and God will give you a long life. That is his promise. Right? In Ephesians 6, he says, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother. Honor them. Esau didn't do that. Esau's parents didn't like something. He went against them. You want the blessing like Jacob? Honor your parents. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. You want to live long on the earth and it to be well with you? Obey your parents and God will bless you. Even in Proverbs, Proverbs 1 8, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Hear your father's law, hear your mother's law, do what they say. It says the same thing in Proverbs, what is it, 6, I think, 6 or 8. It says it again, it says it several times. Listen, God has given us parents for a reason. And you better thank God you have godly parents that actually obey the commandment to love you and to nurture you and admonish you in the Lord. So you better respect them and honor them and obey them. If you do that, here's the promise of a blessing for obedience. That's number six, is the obedience blessing. Number seven and last, go to the end of the chapter uh, to verse number 17. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place! This is none other but the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. That means the house of God. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow. Now, when you vow a vow, you're making a promise. When you take a marriage vow, you're making a promise. He's making a promise to God. If you remember, and I guess we'll back up. There's enough time, and we're pretty much done with this. So let's take a look, because God made him a promise. Look at verse 13. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father, and the God of Isaac, and the land whereon thou liest, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east, and to the north and to the south, and in thee shall all thy seed, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, listen, this is a great promise. And behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest. 
and will bring thee again to this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken unto thee. <laughs> I'll never leave thee nor forsake thee. He says, don't worry, I'm going to be with you the whole way. You're going to go through a journey. You're going to go through an adventure. A lot of things are going to happen to you, but none of it matters because I am with you. I will keep you. I'm not going to bring. To bring I'm going to bring you back just fine. This is God's promise. I will not leave thee. I'll do all the things that I've spoken of thee. Verse 16. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place and I knew it not. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and he took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it, and he called the name of that place Bethel. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob bowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me and will keep me in the way that I go, and will give me the bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. Jacob bows the vow and he says, God said he's going to do all these things and if he does all these things, he is my God. He's always my God. I have great confidence in him. And you know, he was afraid. He's at the house of the Lord. He said, the Lord is in this place. I knew it not. And he was dreadful. And listen, sometimes through the preaching of the word of God, I hope you do get afraid. I hope that really the Holy Spirit works through the preaching to get in your heart and wake you up and say, hey, you need to do something about this problem in your life. That's the point of it. Here, so he responds by vowing a vow and receiving this promise. God, you've made a promise to me and I believe you're going to take me through this journey. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what it's going to be like. It's, it's going to be a strange journey, but I'm, I'm going to look for a wife and a new life and blessings from God in a new land. And God, I trust that you're going to get me through it and bring me home just fine. God wants us to have that kind of great confidence. He says, then shall the Lord be my God. And look at verse 22. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. Now this is most interesting. God didn't say, give me a tenth here, did he? We don't see that instruction from the Lord. So where did he learn this? Where did he learn the concept of tithing? If you remember, in Genesis 14, verse 20, it says, And bless the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand, and he gave him tithes of all. Go to Malachi chapter 3. Jacob learned to be a hard worker and to tithe from his father and from his grandfather. His fathers obeyed the Lord. They gave sacrifice. They gave tithe. And tithing is a blessing. That's number seven. It's the tithe blessing. We return to the Lord, and it's from the heart. God wants a cheerful giver. If, you, if, it, if it hurts you, oh, I don't want to give to God. Can't I just give 3%? I mean, the IRS takes whatever number. It, it costs you 3% to use a credit card. It's 7% tax to buy something. God says, you know what? Of everything that I give you, I want you to give 10% back to me. He's talking, he's swearing this at the house of the Lord. He wants to return it to the house of the Lord. The tithe is given to God. He learned it from the generations before. The father, the grandfather. In Deuteronomy 14.22, he says, Thou shalt truly tithe of all the increase of thy seed that the field bringeth forth year by year. You're in Malachi 3, find verse number 10, and we'll stop here. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. Prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. God is challenging you. And listen, tithing is a commandment for everybody. Tithing is something that parents need to teach their children. My children get an allowance, they're learning to tithe. They don't have the whole money system figured out yet. I still don't have it figured out. Do you know what the Federal Reserve is? All right, that's a whole other conversation, right? I learned tithing at a young age. There are times in my life when I did not tithe. And then I understood that this is something, it's a heart issue. It's a heart issue, and I say it a lot. I don't preach about tithing a lot. You guys can attest to this. I don't. I am not the, let's pass the plate again. Hey, we're going to have a special collection. I do not receive a salary for preaching here. 
I tithe off of my income to this church because that's God's principle. I give 10% of what God gives me and I put it here. Why? To put it back in the house of God so that we can do more for God. I believe that's God's plan for every Christian. But not every Christian has the blessing of tithing. Not everybody's let go of that dime. It's a dime of a dollar. Tithe means tenth. That's where we get the word tithe. And it's a heart issue. God sees your heart. He sees your budget. He knows when you give, and He knows when you don't. I lost my wallet here the past week or two, and honestly, my first, my first thought is, Lord, have I withheld something from you? I had some, some money in there, some cash, like real money, not just cards. And I thought, Lord, was I supposed to give something to you or was I supposed to give something to somebody that I failed in? Is that why you're taking my wallet from me? That was my, honestly my first thought. I want to walk in the fear of the Lord and I want to give back to the Lord what belongs to the Lord. All of my income belongs to the Lord and not 1% of it belongs to alcohol or drugs or Netflix or any of the evil devices of the world. Not 1%. 100% belongs to God, and he says, all this is mine, and I want you, out of, your, out of a pure heart, out of a clear conscience, to just give me 10% back. If ever you're having financial problems, I would encourage you to evaluate yourself, examine yourself on this. Again, verse 10, Malachi 3, verse 10, this is a promise from God. He says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. God says, you're stingy about 10%? Try me. You try it. You prove me now. You see what I'll do. You give that tenth and watch me open the windows and bless everything you put your hands to. Verse 11, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. You say, I raise a garden. I should give some of that to God some way. I don't know if I can carry the veggies in or cash them out and bring the money. And God gave me the increase. You know what? I'll just hold on to that. And God says, okay, well, I'm not going to rebuke the devourer. And here comes that little worm while you're sleeping and eats all your fruit, right? Look what he says. Verse 11, and I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field saith the Lord of hosts what a promise what a cool thing what a neat thing that God says listen if you need help physically prosperity wise on earth just let it go out of your heart give me what's mine return it to me and I will give you more than you can handle. I will give you such abundance you won't have room to keep it all. There is a blessing in tithing, and that's God's promise. He learned that from his father and his grandfather. Dad, are you teaching your children to tithe or to be stingy? Everything you have belongs to the Lord, especially your children, especially your money, especially your time. Make sure you give back to God what's His. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You for these interesting blessings we find in this chapter. Lord, thank You for this awesome illustration that You are the gate of heaven. You're the ladder. The only way that we can ascend from the earth and get to heaven is through the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank You for dying for our sins. I thank You for giving us the gift of salvation. Thank You that it's free and it's not by our works. If we build a tower, we'd never make it, Lord. We trust in You. Lord, I pray that you would help us to become better Christians as we learn from you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.